The following podcast is a deep, shallow dive production. And you're going to love it. Okay, let's go. All right, so seriously, this is super cool because this was my first time that, I mean, it was probably five days ago that I saw something on the internet on Instagram I was like, I got to talk to this guy. And I feel like I stalked you, like I stalked you (laughs) down and then finally got you. Anyway, hey, listen, everybody, if you listened to the last episode that I recorded, episode number 182, you probably heard all the clips from Kaizen Asiadu, who is a life coach and a cultural commentator. And this is a guy that I found on Instagram because honestly, probably less than a week ago, he went viral with what I thought was one of the absolute best, and I'm being serious in saying this, one of the best and most common sense takes that I had heard. And I'm going to say this next part because it's relevant and, and, and it matters from a black guy, let alone mm. from any guy, but especially from a black guy, because the division between Trump and the black community has been so div- divisive, really starting in 2016. And we're going to delve into all this. But Kaizen, man, I-, I seriously really appreciate you coming on. And we're going to have a great discussion just about everything. So why don't we start off with, dude, w- talk us about that first video. Like, what yeah. even caused you to do it i mean i know it was the assassination attempt but give us first of all first of all welcome and then yeah i would love to kind of start there cool thanks man um so i'll give you a bit of background context on sort of my political awakening so in 2016 i voted against trump and in 2020 i voted against trump too but in 2020 we had had four years of trump's presidency and I felt like over the four years, I only saw negative headlines about Trump, like no matter what. And I knew I didn't like the guy, but I was still like, how is it possible that every single thing I hear reported about him is negative? Like, surely it can't be that bad. And at the time, I got a lot of my news from the New York Times because I trusted them as a source of information. But I realized there were subtle things about the way they were talking about him that felt like they were editorializing and they were doing it consistently. It was the choice of wording in headlines. It's saying things like Trump said versus Trump complained. It's all these little things. And I I was paying attention to this and I was like, wait a second, outlets are biased. And what he was saying about fake news, there was something to that. So in 2020, what was going on in my personal life was I quit my job in tech. I was going through a whole spiritual awakening and healing and all this other stuff. And coinciding with the whole process was me just starting to question a lot of things about myself and assumptions that I made about my life. And when you start to question yourself and the way you're living your life, you start to also question what you're being told about the way the world works and everything else. So, you know, it, it's funny, right? Because we, I remember in 2020, there was all this controversy about Trump not wearing a mask during COVID and all these different things. And in hindsight, I look at it, it's like, well, he said... He kept calling it fake news, and now I think it's pretty commonly agreed upon that, yeah, a lot of the news is incredibly biased. There's all this concern about, like, COVID and vaccines and what really happened, so, and it's clear that the thing was hyperbolic. Most of the people who died had comorbidities, and now we have young people who got the vaccine who are dropping dead, and we don't know why. So I started to look at things. I was like, all right, like, there's something I'm missing here. And then most recently, over the last three months, there are three things that happened. One, and I think this was the first thing, Trump got convicted of a felony for paying $150,000 and classifying it as a legal expense of Stormy Daniels. That's right. And there were a few things about that that bothered me. The the first thing was, okay, like, there's an ethical consideration of, did he really fuck a porn star and cheat on his wife? And obviously, if he did, that's not the kind of moral fighter that I expect from a president. But I was like, but that aside, this honestly doesn't feel like a big deal. Like, it might be illegal, but guess what? People do illegal shit all the time. Every American has committed some sort of crime, whether they know it or not. And let's say it rises to the level of felony. It's like, okay, well, is it really worth spending millions of dollars of taxpayer money and pursuing something with this much bigger for misclassifying, uh, I guess, a campaign expense? 
So when I looked at that, I was like, all right, well, this feels like lawfare. Instead yeah. of warfare, it's lawfare. It feels like we're weaponizing law and we're being very selective with what we're prosecuting with taxpayer money and resources because in the blue state of New York, they don't like Trump. So that was the first thing that made me feel like, hey, it feels like the, there's we're not playing a purely objective game here. There's There's an agenda here. So... First, there was all the cancellation stuff that they tried to do with Trump over yep. the course of 2016 to 2024 from a media standpoint, and now it was a conviction. Yeah. The second thing that made me start to feel like something's, got, something's really off here was Biden's debate performance. Yeah. I don't think anyone can watch that two hours of Biden talking and be like, yeah, this guy is sharp as a whip and he's in full possession of his cognitive faculties. He's not. He's like very right. clearly not. And if you go back and you look at footage of what a lot of mainstream political commentators were saying, they're pushing this narrative that Biden is, is sharp. He's sharper than ever. Joe Scarborough from MSNBC was literally, you can go watch the clip yourself, saying that he is um, cognitively the best he's ever been. Or he maybe said intellectually the best he's ever been. Yeah. And yeah. I looked at that. I was like, you guys are just lying. Yeah. Like, there's, there's just no world where you can look at that and say that he's sharper than he's ever been. So that was a second thing. <clears throat> And then the third and the straw that broke the camel's back for me was when Trump almost got assassinated. And regardless of your views, your political affiliations, and I'm someone who was in support of RFK Jr., that's still who I plan on voting for. If you get to the point where things have been so hyperbolized and radicalized that a 20-year-old guy thinks that he is literally killing Hitler and he thinks of himself as a hero, so he's actually going to try to kill another man, another human being, and more people were celebrating it. Yeah, if we're celebrating violence, that it's clear that we've lost a plot as a civilization and we need to re-examine what's being said because, look, I think there's enough content to have a reasonable disagreement about whether Trump or Biden is best to lead the country. But it is clear that if we're celebrating the near assassination of the person and people are justifying it, we are no longer in a world where the facts matter to us. And instead... What's happened is we've assigned these labels. Labels just get assigned to these people and people keep on filtering all data through those labels. So it's like, and it happens on both sides. Like I just made a video about this. Like um, Biden makes a joke about if you're not black, that uh, if you vote for me, then you're not black. Now, really yeah. shitty joke. And he didn't yeah. deliver it very well, but it was a joke. He was trying to make a joke. It's yeah. very yeah. obvious. I think right? that was on uh, Charlemagne the God's podcast or something. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, and Charlemagne the God's podcast is all about jokes and taking the piss out of one another. And Charlemagne's always making fun of white people. Yeah. But all of a sudden, because Biden tries to make a joke and he sucks, all of a sudden, all you get is the text. You get the text from Instagram commenters and all these people saying, oh, Biden said you're not black if you don't vote for him, so he's racist. Or with Trump, I, it's, it's frankly even worse. I think the media distortion around Trump is worse than it is of Biden. No, it absolutely is. Listen, everything you said... It, 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 Again, and I've told you this through our DMs and all that. It's just, and I've commented on all your stuff. It's just common sense. Like I really mm. was a, I really got attracted to the content you were putting out because it was all common sense to me. And I, and I think we'll get into that first video that you put out because I know you know that one was was the start of all this. But let me ask you one one question. Prior to 2016, prior to Trump even running for president, what were you? What was your views on trump probably yeah. nothing right like ah he's the yeah. guy from the celebrity apprentice right or like yumpy yump donald trump like dude's a billionaire like like i the reason i ask that is because i do think what has happened to him has been manufactured and i look back at at i mean he's been in like 50 rap song lyrics you know what i mean yeah. He was on Oprah six times. He was on The View four times. You got mm -hmm. Trump with Diddy, Trump with, I mean, 50 Cent's a different, a different beast, and he is a beast. But you've got Trump, you know, with all of these people, nobody prior to 2016. And again, I'm not a, I'm not a Trump guy either at all. Like I've on the podcast, I've said this a thousand times. I'm like, I'm not all in on the dude. I'm not all in on anybody. I'm a registered independent. And even as being a registered independent, I still don't know if I'm going to, who I'm going to vote for yet. I'm kind of waiting. But my, my long winded question was, what did you think of him prior to 2016? Or was, was, was it not even on your radar? 
I didn't think about Trump at all prior to 2016. <laughs> like he was just a, a pre- guy on the apprentice. You're fired. You know, yeah. he was fun to watch. Yeah. Um, he seemed like a media darling. So to me, the, in hindsight, the massive 180 from Trump is a media darling to Trump is the reincarnation of Hitler was like crazy whiplash in hindsight. Yeah. Yeah, and I was like, if this guy was really that bad, I think we would have known it. And uh, it's funny that you mentioned Diddy. I mean, the Diddy thing didn't age well. But yeah, yeah people in hip-hop loved him because he was a picture of the American dream. He was a picture of a guy who, you know, yeah, he had some advantages, but he, he didn't start off life as a billionaire. It's pretty fucking hard to make a billion dollars, whatever you no, want to ex- say. Exactly. And, and again, mm-hmm. I mean, my, my whole thing is calling a spade a spade. And it's like, you got to be truthful about this stuff, which is really what, what you're doing and what I, what I'm hoping you continue to do, even, even though I know it's difficult. All right. So mm-hmm. now let's talk about, so you put that first video out, like the motivation, it seems was that people were celebrating, people were celebrating, the, you know, the assassination, which is sick in and of itself. So then what mm. happened when you hit, first of all, were you nervous to even like put that out there? Were you like, uh, okay, send. Yeah. Yeah. Bro. I'm, I'm nervous and scared every single time I put out a, a, a Instagram video because it's vulnerable. Yeah, it is. Right. It's vulnerable saying something that you actually believe it's vulnerable questioning the status quo. You know, I have friends, I used to work in tech. So a lot of my friends are left leaning. I, I was thinking, like, am I going to lose friends? Am I going to piss people off? And, you know, I did piss some people off, unfortunately. Or rather, they got pissed off looking at what I said. And a lot of people just misunderstood what I was even saying. Because it was ironic that I, there was a lot of positive reception. Overall, it was very positive reception. Um, but a lot of people thought I, it meant I was switching sides. And I'm like, that's the whole problem. Yeah. This idea that there's a side and you're either side A, side B. I'm like, I'm not about sides. This is actually not even about Trump. This is just about the truth. And how no matter what a person is, we can still exaggerate and hyperbolize to the point where we radicalize each other. So for sure, I was scared and I'm still scared. But to me, me, me saying these things is more important than my fear. So that's why I was speaking up. Did you, uh, that's awesome, dude. Did you have like friends or family be like, Hey dude, this is starting to go viral because again, it really, I mean, that went viral. I mean, I think at this point it's probably well over 200,000 views and then the amount of comments and all that. But did you start like noticing it? And was this kind of your first post that really took off like that? Yeah. So it, it was, it's actually quite interesting because I think it really hit a chord that is deep in the culture because it went viral on Instagram, actually went even more viral on TikTok. Oh. It went viral on Twitter. Uh, and then I've even gotten some people sending me like YouTube clips. It ended up on one of New York Times podcasts. So I think I, I really struck a chord that goes beyond algorithms. And I had never experienced anything like that. I mean, in, in my professional life, I'm a life coach. I teach people about personal empowerment. What I talk about is relatively safe, right? It's hard to get upset about things that I'm preaching. Um, but I got to a point where I was like, you know, actually a lot of what I'm viewing as the problems that individual people have with fear and living life from conditioning and worrying too much about other people think and making career choices, relationship choices, all these choices, a lot of what I was witnessing on an individual level, I was also witnessing on the collective level and all that's happening, bro, is people are scared. Yeah. Yeah. People are scared. I think, I think that's exactly it. They're scared. And when you're scared, you look to an authoritarian figure to kind of tell you what to do. It's actually exactly what happened in COVID. I mean, think about what happened in COVID. All of a sudden this crazy thing, whatever comes and people are looking for somebody to tell them what to do, to tell them how to act. And I, and I truly, again, I truly believe the, the uniqueness of the Trump situation is that he, came on the scene and then all of the sudden it was like he went from being part of this I talk about the uniparty all the time which is like all these guys collectively yes they're republican and they're democrat but when they take off their their top layer they're wearing the same jersey and I truly believe in that concept when it comes to government and then and then what happened was Trump was the guy that was like you know what I don't want to be a part of this. I'm going to drain the swamp. I'm going to do all that. You know, the challenge with the guy is just his delivery. I I always say, imagine Trump 
with Obama's delivery and his articulation. Like the guy would probably be on a whole different level. Let's move into, so that first video, your first video comes out, you're getting crazy, crazy response to it. I read through some of the comments and it was interesting because you did have a lot of like, uh, glad you woke up, bro. Welcome to the right side, bro. Trump 2024, all that. And then you had some like the hate stuff that, that was obviously against it. So then what was going through your mind? Were you like, oh man, I need to like, I need to like do something else. I need to put out another one. Talk us through those next steps. Man. Yeah. Ironically, what bothered me more than the negative comments were the positive comments that misunderstood okay. what I was saying. Awesome. Because I didn't want people to take what I was saying as justification for their existing beliefs. I wanted people to question their beliefs and question how they're consuming media and question the level of identification they have with Republican, Democrat, red, blue, all of this. And I just want people to think for themselves. That's, no. that's literally it. So um, I didn't feel like I made a mistake or anything. I was like, this was a, this video came from the heart. Um, but I did want to clarify in follow-up videos, like this is not justification for Trump, right? This is not me trying to be the poster, the black poster kid for your party. This is me expressing what I think a lot of people in the middle, which I think is a majority of America are, are thinking, which is we've gone too far. We've yeah. gone too far. And in this case, I do think it's the left hyperbolizing more than the right. Now, Trump is not a victim here because he's been saying incendiary things. And I think but my biggest criticism of Trump is he just lacks grace a lot yeah. of the time. And I hope that if he does get elected, he's more statesmanlike and has more grace. But, you know, he also came in as a revolutionary who said, I'm going to fuck shit up, drain the swamp, the news is fake. And he's right. Yeah. <laughs> he's yeah. Right. No, he, he is. He is. And it was like, I, I always loved that Dave Chappelle uh, one of his standups where he's like, you know, when the day Trump came on the scene was during the debate with Hillary, it was either during the debate with Hillary or a discussion with Hillary. And then Chappelle was like, you know, you always make, I'm going to paraphrase, but he was basically like, you know, do I, do I take advantage of the tax code? Absolutely. And the reason I know that is because her donors do the same exact thing that I do. So I thought, I thought Chappelle put that so well because he really made everybody understand that, you know, Trump was really lifting up the curtain a little bit to show everybody what goes on behind the scenes. And I think that that was what drew people to him. And by the same token, I think those people who had been hiding behind that curtain for generations, probably that was when they were like, holy shit, this guy's going to ruin it for all of us. And I truly think that's when the opposition to Trump started. And then that's yeah. when all of this, because again, I, I look back, I was exactly like you prior to 2016. I'd watch him on Celebrity Apprentice once in a while. He's in a Nelly track here. He's in a Diddy track here. I never thought anything of him besides, honestly, besides this guy's the American dream. You know, I don't care if he started out with 5 million. Like you said, he went to a billion and that's pretty damn impressive. All right. Mm -hmm. So let's see. Let's see. So, so, so where are things at now in terms of, I mean, your thought process, like you, you, you probably watched, uh, or I don't even know if you did or not, but did you watch his speech last night to close out the, the RNC convention? No, I haven't watched it in full. Okay. Okay. All right. Let's talk about RFK Jr. A little bit. I want to get, I want to get your thoughts on him. What, what is it about him that kind of appeals to you? Yeah. So I, I think I like RFK Jr. Because I think he's a revolutionary and I mean revolutionary in the strictest terms. Like he's trying to create a revolution in governments and He's been doing that his whole life. Like he's, that's been his job to fight corruption. And he has a long track record of success. And I was drawn to him because I feel like of all the candidates, he's most deeply actually committed to just making change. Uh, and I think that he is more of a unifying force. Like he doesn't resort to incendiary rhetoric like Trump. And frankly, I think he's just a lot more confident seeming than the current version of Biden. Like I just have zero confidence in the current version of Biden. So I liked RFK, and I think a lot of what he's saying is actually common sense. But unfortunately, he's not as charismatic as Trump, and he has the voice conditions, so it's yeah. just hard for him to connect with people. 
on an emotional level in the same way. And look, I'm going to be straight up. I'm planning on voting for him, but I don't think he's going to win. But the reason I'm going to vote for him anyway is because I don't think we get to a better world by constantly trying to choose a lesser evil, which is what I think people do. They like kind of resign like, oh, well, I don't think Bernie Sanders or, or Ron Paul or any of these people can win. So I'm just going to vote for what I think is lesser evil. But guess what? If we do that, we end up in a defeatist cycle where no independent candidate can ever get enough momentum to win. So I'm voting for RFK now, not because of 2024, but for 2028 or 2032. And I hope that eventually we get to a point where there's a viable independent candidate who can win. But um i yeah i just think he i think he's incredibly reasonable i think his yeah. mastery of uh his command of the facts is incredible if you listen to him he has like encyclopedic knowledge of no, this he stuff absolutely here, yeah he so absolutely does. i mm. wish uh man I, and i've talked about him a lot on the podcast i wish mm. his voice wasn't the way it was i i unfortunately that just affects the delivery and it affects people's ability to really process the things he's saying but like he's one of Actually, not one of he's the only guy that talks about things like the military industrial complex mm -hmm. and talks about, you know, the the the, the laundering laundering of money in, in many in many ways. And and like I've said this before, like to all my listeners and friends who love Trump, I'm like. Trump never talks about that. I've never heard him talk about that. Biden obviously never talks about it because he empowers that. But I will tell you another thing in one of your clips that you said, there were actually several things, but the one thing that I loved was you were like, I'm looking at the past four years or I'm looking at the past really three and a half years with Biden. And it's like, mm -hmm. we're in, we're in a couple wars that I don't know why we're in those, these wars. And I loved that because mm -hmm. I think more people should be like, wait a minute, why are we in these wars? And then yeah. secondly, the other thing you said, which was awesome, and I've talked about it a lot, is the border. You know, the situation on the border. It's like, hey, what the hell? You guys ignored it, Democrats, for three years now. Now all of a sudden you're bringing it up. And again, to call a spade a spade, and to be fair, the Republicans have been on this since 2016. I mean, the I infamous beginning of the Trump wall. So I, so, so I loved those points. I wish people would, would take those and focus on that versus, you know, yeah. this just vitriol hate. Oh man. Well, what do you, what do you think is going to happen? What do you think is going to happen with Biden now moving forward? You think he's going to drop out? Yeah. So I, I want to get to that, but just yeah. briefly on your point, because I think it's really important. We've gotten to a point where sound bites and people's character portrayals seem to be more important than the actual results, which is really scary. It shows a disconnection from the most important thing, which is what results can this person deliver? And I, I hear people say stuff like Trump is an existential threat to democracy, which to me is, is, is clear hyperbole because existential threat to democracy means democracy will cease to exist after the person is there or uh, democracy will be eroded. And guess what? He was president from 2016 to 2020. And as far as I can tell, democracy is very much intact. And people say basically that the Democrats platform, which I, which is a criticism I levied in the video is, well, we're not Trump. So vote for us, which is not, that's not a foundation for real progress at all. Yeah. And so if I, I look at what they stand for. It doesn't appear to be anything clear. Um, I look at 2016 to 2020, no foreign wars, levels of illegal immigration were lower. Abraham Accord in the Middle East was signed. North Korea and South Korea were starting to talk about, uh, they're trying to talk and communicate. You had the first time that a U.S. president was allowed into North Korea. There's actually a lot of stuff on the foreign affairs front, for sure. And as you said, for three years, Biden ignored the border. And now all of a sudden, there's a border um, bill that, that gets voted in. And yeah, people say, well, the Republicans rejected it. Well, I haven't looked at the border bill, but I would guess it's because there's a bunch of provisions and stuff loaded into there. So it has to be mass deportation, but at the same time, the reason we're even in this scenario is because the border hasn't been taken care of. So what like I hear the biggest thing that I hear levied against Trump is he's a liar or I don't like his character, but a lot of those lies are media distortions. And I want to hear what the actual lies are. <laughs> and I think all politicians lie. So honestly, that's not damning to me. Yeah. So what I'm I'm gonna vote for RFK and you know, sometimes people are like, well, you you can allow Trump. I actually think Trump is better than Biden. 
Now, what do I think should happen is I think the, the Democratic Party should put immense pressure on Biden to step down. And I think that's happening. And I hope he steps down and put a real candidate and can actually get a platform together and actually stand for something up there so that I can do an evaluation of some competent candidates. But don't put this guy who is borderline in dementia, maybe in early stage dementia up there and tell me, well, he's better than the other guy because the other guy, we don't like what he says. That's nonsense. Yeah. Yeah. It's nonsense. Are, 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 do you feel like the black community is thinking like you now? Mm -hmm. Um, look, I, I've, I've never wanted to present myself as the black guy who's commenting yeah, on you. politics, you know, and, and it's inevitable because I'm black, right? So yeah. people are going to make a bunch of associations and that's okay. It doesn't bother me, but I don't pretend to speak for anyone but myself. Okay. And I, I actually don't even like the idea of like the, the black community. Because it's like, no, it should be individuals thinking about what are their values, what are their needs. Racial issues are one of them, but they're not the only issues to vote on. And I think for a long time now, the Black community, as it were, has been pandered to by Democrats saying, we're going to fix your problem. Republicans hate you. They're a bunch of racists. We got you. And as far as I can see, in, at least in the last 20 years, it hasn't made a big difference who's in office. Even when Obama was in office, I don't know. I certainly know that my life has not changed that much, but I don't think I typify the Black experience. Again, I'm a first-generation immigrant. My parents are from Ghana. I don't really identify with a lot of Black struggle because that, that trauma is not in my lineage, right? But at the same time, it's like, yeah, obviously I care about my experience as a Black person, but I'm not convinced that Biden is, is particularly more... Um, Apt to solve the problems that black people face. And frankly, I, I don't like this view that a, a party needs to save anyone. Yeah, uh, that's a great point. That's a great point. That's a great point. That was all incredibly well said. All right, let's see. Okay, so Biden, I, I mean, I think the same thing. I've, I've been saying I think it's going to be Gavin Newsom that they yeah. slide into that spot. A lot of people mm -hmm. obviously think it's going to be Kamala. They're like, it has to be her. You know, mm -hmm. I don't even know who else would be on the chessboard. Maybe Hillary, but man, I think people hate her so much that like, mm -hmm. and she's so divisive. She's like f female divisiveness that Trump has. Um, I don't know, man. I mean, what, what are your thoughts on Kamala? Actually, I'd love to kind of get your opinion on her. Yeah, so I'll say I'm not well informed on Kamala. Okay, uh, I'm I, so I, I I'm not someone who follows politics consistently. I, I don't really have a lot of observations of her work. Um, I haven't been impressed by her, frankly. Um, I and that's all I can really say about her. Okay. And uh, on the point about um, you made a point that I want to respond to here. Give me a second. What what genius point did I make? Let me see. <laughs> There are too many to count, so we'll, we'll find another one. <laughs> all right, all right. All right, what, do, what culturally, let's talk a little more like cultural commentary. Like, like, I mean, what else do you have opinions on? Do you have, do you have thoughts on like the, the women playing men's sports? I mean, that one mm. to me is kind of a big one, but well, what else? I'd love to, I'd love to understand a little more cultural commentary. Sure. Actually, I remember what the point was, and it was about Gavin Newsom. Okay. And this is this dovetails into the point about cultural commentary. So um, I personally think Gavin Newsom has a horrendous track record. Uh, and I think that from direct experience as a Californian, someone who's lived here for 10 years, someone who's seen the homeless problem exponentially increase. I've literally been called the N-word in public parks by a homeless guy who's starting to kill me. And then the same thing happened a few weeks later. And I see what happened in San Francisco when he, where he was mayor. So I think he's had a horrendous track record with California. And, it, and, and uh, moreover, I mean, we talk about like character portrayals and like Trump is a bad guy. And a lot of it is based on what he said. But Gavin Newsom literally put in place and was recommending COVID restrictions while going with his family to the French Laundry to have a dinner with his mask off. It's caught on video. So to me, yeah. that's like a clear... A, a clear lack of integrity in governance. I mean, I didn't, just in his personal life, in governance. And then in his personal life, he cheated with his best friend's wife on his wife. So <laughs> it's like, you know, we can talk about things that people say, and I don't like how Trump said that, but I, I don't think Gavin Newsom is, is, a, is a good leader at all, and I don't think he's a genuine uh, person from what I've seen. Um, now, in terms of cultural commentary, recently there was this bill passed. I don't know if you've been following this, but basically, I'm letting you go as factual as possible. But California public schools 
will be banned from disclosing to parents of children who elect that they are trans, they, they want to be trans or non-binary, or they change their gender pronouns. Parents will not know that. So basically what it means is that the state will now have an intimate relationship with children over their gender identity. Now, look, I think it's great that we live in a world where people can have trans surgeries and, and, and change the pronouns and all that. I think if people are genuinely committed to that identity, I'm glad that the science is supportive of that, of that possibility. That said, I think in the vast majority of cases, it's not coming from a healthy and healed place. I don't think people wanting to change their gender is generally coming from a healthy and healed place. doesn't mean we need to shame people, but we need to identify it for what it is in many cases. It is gender dysphoria. It is a disorder. And when people have a disorder, you don't say to the st to, to parents that you can't know about this disorder. You can't know that little Timmy thinks that he's actually Tammy. And, and we're not going to tell you. No, the parents are the first and last line of defense when it comes to raising a healthy, well-integrated child. And the idea that we've gone so far into this zone of everything's permissible, identity is the most important thing, you could be whatever you want, that we are not allowing for the fact that children, when you're a child, it's a very confusing time. And it's even more confusing now, right? Like it's even more confusing to be a, a little boy or girl. So the idea that a parent doesn't get to know if a child is questioning their gender and intervene is ridiculous. And it's a, unfortunately, it's like you risk being called a bad guy just for saying that. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I honestly, I was blown away when I saw that they passed that. That is, that is such a assault on the parental family unit in many ways. Yeah. Like I, it just again, that's another one that just doesn't make sense. I mean, I support, I support LGBTQ plus. I support. I support transgenders. I really do. I had a transgender. She was my Wendy Cole. She was my first episode that I did. And she mm -hmm. enlightened the shit out of me and the audience. And she humanized the transgender process because she was somebody that went through full transition, sexual reassignment, transition surgery at the age of 67. And mm -hmm. I was like, Wendy, that's amazing. Like, listen, you live your life, you know, live your life. It's not my life. It's your life. So I love that she did that. But the fact that they passed this, you know, to, to really cause that wedge between schools and the parents, I, I, I think it's going to have tremendous ramifications and hopefully it gets, it gets repealed and taken back. Um, all right, man, what else? Anything else on your mind? Anything else you want to, you want to drop some dimes on us? Yeah. Uh, so this is kind of like a an eagle eye view on society and culture right now and like why things just keep on getting more divisive and hyperbolized. I think fundamentally the issues here are we are in fear and when there's fear, there's identification. And what I mean is, look, the humans have, it's always been scary to be a human being. Like it's never not going to be scary, I suspect, to be a human being. But right now it's scary and we live in such a networked world that fear can propagate and be amplified so quickly with just the tweet or a message here and there. And we didn't used to be so connected to each other that we could basically hear each other's fearful thoughts in real time. So that's why things are amplifying. And when that happens, we become tribal. We revert to our baser instincts. So people are now reverting to their basic instincts. And when, when you're in that state, it's like you don't care so much about what the truth is. You care about size and what side do you feel safe with? And uh, although I think there's nothing wrong with that, that is what's contributing to the fundamental divide that's been building and building and building. And I think the first thing that needs to happen is as a society, we just have a collected exhale and say, hey, we are all just fucking scared. That's what's really going on. We're, we're all just scared. And when people are scared, they're even tribal. They start otherizing other people, it's like calling them names. And you even think of the names that people call each other like, they're a homophobe, transphobe, racist, Islamophobe, xenophobe, you know, communist, socialist. Well, even think about the word, right? If you call someone anything phobe, well, phobe means fear. Like if someone's a arachnophobe, they have a fear of spiders. So even if someone was some sort of phobe, let's say someone is a racist, which is basically a phobia, right? Well, the way that you deal with a child who is scared of something is you help them feel safe. You help them understand what they're afraid of. 
and then you gently expose them to that thing until they're not afraid of it. You don't call them names. You don't say that they're a bad person for their fear. And you don't, you don't say celebrate them on those getting killed. So we got to a point where it's like, we're so disconnected from our humanity and we're so disconnected from the fact that we're afraid that we're looking at other people who are also afraid and we're wishing ill upon them. And that's, that doesn't lead anywhere positive. So my general view on the world is like, look, everything that's happening in the outer world is just a reflection of our inner world. This is not about Trump. This is not about Biden. This is not about Democrats. This is not about Republicans. This is about people being scared, confused, in their heads, willing to accept any narrative that justifies their current worldview and makes them feel safe. And what we actually need for people to do right now is get real and vulnerable with each other, acknowledge you're afraid, and we can come together and we can get out of the situation. But this is Biden, Trump is not really going to matter. I don't think either of them is fundamentally going to change government in a massive way. Um, and unfortunately, I think as a species right now, we're dealing with so much pain. And um, I, I think the I know for me why I changed. I you know went through this huge awakening and journey in my life. I changed because I was in pain. Mm. I changed because I was at a point where I was like, hey, I'm considering suicide. So it's either that or fucking change. And I think right now, human, humanity is on the brink of suicide, like existential self-destruction. But the light side of that is if we can wake up and we can realize what's actually going on, which is just we're afraid, then we can look inside and actually address it and get real foundational change. And I think on the other side is an amazing fucking world, well beyond any of the petty stuff that we're dealing with. That was unbelievably well said. I really enjoyed that. All right, two things. One is I am going to ask you to potentially be a ongoing part of the deep shallow dive maybe once a month once a quarter man i gotta have you on to provide cultural commentary because i think you've delivered today something that honestly has been a little bit missing on this show even and and, and i've really enjoyed it and i really enjoy your takes and keep 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 giving your takes on social media even though i know that's sometimes difficult Secondly, as a life coach, man, where can people find you? Because I have a feeling some people are going to want to look you up. So I want to, I want you to tell everybody how to, how to find you. I'll put everything in the show notes, but yeah, tell everybody how to find you because they're going to want to. <laughs> so first of all, thank you, Ray. I'm, I'm really honored. And yeah, I would love to contribute to your platform. I think what you're doing is awesome. I think it, I just love that there's common sense takes and it's like, it makes me hopeful for the future. So Dude, thank you for what you're doing. And I appreciate the invitation as well. Um, and yeah, I mean, if people are interested in working with me, you can shoot me a DM if you already know, it's like, hey, let's fucking do something. Or you can check out my web website. It's that's kaizen.com. And that's kaizen on TikTok, Instagram, and pretty much everywhere. So T-H-A-T-S, kaizen. Okay, perfect. And I'll, and I'll get all that and I'll put those in the show notes so they're there for people. All right, man, listen. Seriously, I'm glad we made this happen. This was like you're my you're my first guest that I that I stalked from from beginning <laughs> to fruition and we made it happen. I really enjoyed it. For everybody that's listening, if you didn't listen to episode 182, give a listen to that and then obviously you're definitely want, gonna want to listen to this one because you probably are listening to this one. But anyway, Kaizen, listen, really appreciated it. Look forward to having you as an ongoing contributor to the DSD, and keep doing you, brother, and keep being you because it, it, it's affecting people, and it affected me. It genuinely did. You affected me. You 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 enlightened me. You awakened me even more, and and I learned from your comment your content and i and i look forward to continuing to do that thank you so much man and i really am honored to be here so thank you and you keep doing what you're doing too all right brother this episode was brought to you by the new book deep shallow dive into you available now on amazon and barnes and noble in hardcover and paperback don't forget to sign up for our new mailing list on our website at deepshallowdive.com